Hey, what's up everybody? Uh, today is my 10 year Twitter anniversary, apparently. 10 years since I put my first tweet onto the platform. Uh, I can't remember what it is. Um, I'm gonna try and find it out. And if I can find out what it was, I'll post it on the screen for you right now because it may be something insightful, but probably not. Um, but anyway, 10 years, it sort of prompted me to think back over 10 years and I put something on Twitter this morning saying how should I celebrate this and as ever loads of you guys have responded. Uh, some of you by saying I should be drinking beer in my garden, which I will do later on, uh, cake, um, there were all sorts of suggestions, some of which I probably can't even repeat <laughs> on here. But it did prompt me to think back over the last 10 years of Twitter, but also of, of Formula One and of my life, and, and try to think back, prompted by a question from Ricky Lazarus, who said, quite simply, what's been your favourite F1 moment of the last 10 years? And that was a really tough one to think about because there are so many. 10 years is quite a long time. It flies by, doesn't it, when you're having fun, which I have over the last 10 years, but it's quite a long period of time. A lot has happened to Formula One and to all of us over 10 years. It's actually longer than that since I left McLaren. It's 11 years since I left the team. So in the last 10 year period, I wasn't working for a Formula One team. So it was a huge change in my life. And if I think back when I left the team and I was in this for a small period of time in this no man's land of not really knowing what to do next, it was the media that I kind of turned to to, to sort of focus on my next career and Twitter was a part of that. So I remember launching a Twitter account or signing up for a Twitter account thinking, wow, this is a big step for me. This is like just what kind of major celebrities do, have a Twitter account. And I remember doing it, being quite nervous about it. Of course, now you throw away tweets like they, they mean nothing. Um, but anyway, you know, 10 years ago when I started that, I went down this, this path of trying to start writing uh, for various magazines, well initially just on a blog, and then for various magazines and, uh, and websites and that kind of thing, and it gradually got picked up. And the reason it got picked up was because of Twitter, because it was the first time that you could share an online article, like a written article, you could share it around and then other people could share it around. And I remember a few people picking up on my articles that I was writing about what life was like working for a Formula One team and sharing them and then gradually sort of started to build and get more and more people looking at them and viewing them and some really nice feedback coming back. And then eventually one day I got a tweet back uh, from a guy called Jason Swales, who uh, he's a good friend of mine. Many of you will know Jason because he is Will Buxton's partner in crime, uh, currently at Formula One on the digital team but also at NBC, and before all of that, Jason Swales was the producer of the BBC's um, Radio 5 Live Formula One coverage on the radio. Jason retweeted, and was actually a big supporter of me, retweeted a lot of my articles, saying they were great. He then tweeted me one day saying, do you know what, your articles are a real insight that no one else is offering right now. He said, I think it might translate onto the radio. He said, do you fancy giving me a quick ring? I was on the phone quicker than you can possibly imagine. I rang Jason and uh, and I said, yeah, hi mate, you know, what's going on? He said, look, I think this could really translate to the radio. He said, how do you fancy coming along to the British Grand Prix and, uh, and being a pit lane reporter? Well, my jaw hit the floor and I, it's not something I'd really thought about doing or a, a career that I'd thought about pursuing, but my goodness, I loved the idea. I could not say thank you enough times. I was down to the British Grand Prix with the biggest smile on my face. I hadn't been for a couple of years because I'd left the team. Straight back to Silverstone with the biggest grin on my face. I went through a weekend working alongside Jenny Gow, who was also amazing and, uh, and really kind and really welcoming to me. And we sort of, I shadowed her for the weekend and I did some reporting of my own. It was just brilliant. I loved every second. I remember driving home on the Sunday night uh, from the British Grand Prix, calling my wife saying, I just had the most incredible weekend. I think I've just found my new career. And I remember saying those words and not being able to contain myself because I'd loved it so much. And I did make that my next career. And it was off the back of that that I then started to pursue those avenues. And I started pestering people like Sky and uh, you know for roles to guest slots on shows. And I did a bit some stuff for them. I did some stuff for ESPN, I did some co-commentary back in the day for ESPN Star Sports. Um, lots of little tiny slots, each of which I was massively grateful for and loved every single one of them. 
And then Sky came to me and said, look, we, we think that you have this unique experience, another take on Formula One that none of our pundits have. How do you fancy coming to work for us? And I did, and I spent three or four years working for Sky Sports at uh, most of the Grand Prix, uh, mostly behind the scenes at the races, but also um, working alongside Natalie Pinkham on the, uh, the midweek report, or the F1 report, as it later became known. Again, roles that in, a, in a career that I loved as much as the first career working for a Formula One team. And I genuinely feel so lucky to have had kind of two careers within a sport that I love, both of which I love to the same level. Completely different experiences, completely different challenges. I mean, working for a Formula One team was always my dream. Literally a dream come true. But working in the F1 media and in broadcasting and everything that I've gone on to do since that was a dream that I didn't even know I had until I was able to, to be lucky enough to try it. So huge thank you to Twitter and to Jason Swales for giving me that initial opportunity and to Jenny and to all those people that have helped me along the way. That's where I've ended up where I am now. And the reason, and so when we talk about my favorite moment in F1, I think it's hard to look past that moment in the last 10 years when I started and, and went to do that, that weekend as a pit lane reporter. It was 2012. Uh, the British Grand Prix with uh, with the BBC. Amazing dream come true and kick-started my second career. So that is my first amazingly brilliant favourite F1 moment that I've been involved with. But then when I started working for Sky and being part of the circus again on a sort of weekly basis, there was another moment that stood out for me when I was thinking about this. There are loads and loads, but one in an F1 sense that stood out was the moment that Max Verstappen took his first win. And the reason that I say that is partly because it was an amazing thing to be there and witness. Just this kid being promoted in his first race up to the main team at such a young age, such inexperience in Formula One terms, being given that opportunity and then to see him win it. But on a personal level, even just before that happened, I remember being sat with Simon Lazenby and, uh, and Damon Hill and Johnny Herbert, I think, in the, uh, I think we're in the Williams motorhome, waiting for the start of the race, watching it on the monitors. I think the two Mercs were first and second, Max was third on the grid. And Simon turned around and said, come on then, let's have your bets. Who's going to do what at the start? Of the, who's going to win the race? How's it going to go? What's going to happen? And I just went, do you know what? I think the two Mercs are going to wipe each other out. Max is going to go on to win. And everybody laughed. <laughs> what happened? First corner, uh, two Mercs wipe each other out. Max goes on to have this incredible race where he holds off Kimi for large parts with huge pressure and goes on to win it in the most dramatic style. The place erupted. And, um, and then my role after the race was to launch myself with a microphone into the media scrum. And when I say that, I mean it was like going into a rugby scrum. Elbows out, everyone fighting to get to the front. Trying to grab Max because we were entitled to an interview being a, a live broadcaster at the time. And, uh, and dragging him out of the scrum for this interview. And it was this amazing experience to see the, the fuss that was going on around him, the passion that he ignited in everybody, not just because of that amazing success, but because of the, the route to stardom that this kid was, was definitely on. And so being there for that moment was also a pretty special time, uh, just on a personal level. I think it's a pretty special moment in F1 history anyway, given that he has grown into this guy that, is undoubtedly going to be, he's already a star, but will grow to be an even bigger and bigger star. So to be there in those moments were just incredible. And it's this, the luck, the luck and the, and, I'm, and it's why I'm so grateful to have had these careers because it's provided not only the, the jobs that I've had, which I've loved, but these prime time seats that I've been able to get in some of the most amazing moments. And this is the last 10 years we're talking about because of my 10 year Twitter anniversary. Before that, of course, there were so many others, uh, many of which are in my book. Uh, of course, which, which um, you know, was the basis of that. So some incredible times in the last 10 years. And, uh, and I have to say, Twitter has played a big role in that. And even once I've now gone onto YouTube, and this is another big moment in my last 10 years, is starting this YouTube channel, which came about, by the way, because I lost the role at Sky. Uh, I lost my role at uh, uh, Formula E because the job that I was doing was, was sort of made redundant in that role. So I was suddenly without my two main motorsports broadcasting roles had disappeared. And so I thought, well, you could see this as a really depressing moment, you know, in my career in that, where do I go now? Or I could see it as a big opportunity, which is exactly what I did. And I thought, if no one else is going to put me on telly, <laughs> I love it so much, I'll put myself on. And I went down, uh, I remember going down on New Year's Day uh, to the beach at West Wittering 
here in the UK, taking a camera with me, a rubbish camera, no microphone, the wind was terrible, and I remember talking into that camera for the very first time, thinking, uh, I'll just give it a go. I think probably 15 people or so watched the video, and um, you know, I went on to do them every day, I think, for, for the next couple of weeks. Maybe 100 people watched the videos didn't matter at all because I realised that I loved it. I was free of all the restrictions of producers from TV companies and, and production companies and broadcasters telling you where to stand, what to say, what to wear, what to do. I had total freedom to do whatever I wanted and that is exactly why this channel has become what it's become. You know, it's not about how many people watch it for me. I genuinely am not bothered about that. I mean, it, you know, it's great that people are enjoying it and if more people enjoy it, brilliant. But that's definitely not my motivation. I'm doing this because I absolutely love what I do. And of course, Twitter is a great place to enable me to share those videos around through my Twitter following. And of course, you guys are brilliant in retweeting these things and sharing it to a bigger and wider audience. So amazing moments in my, in my last 10 years. I just thought it might be interesting to reflect on those off the back of that question from Ricky. So thank you, Ricky. And thank you to everybody who responded to that tweet this morning. Um, somebody also said to me, that we should give away a signed copy of my book as a celebration of 10 years on Twitter. And I thought, why not? It's also the 400th video that I've done on YouTube, which also seems like a moment we should be celebrating. So I am going to give away a signed copy of my book. I've just got to think about how I'm going to do that and who I'm going to give it to. Bear with me. OK, here we go. What I'm going to do, and I don't know if this will work or not, but I'm going to ask you Maybe this is a bit self-indulgent, self but if <laughs> it feels like relevant to what this video is about, 10 years on Twitter. I'd like you to go back, have a look through my tweets, and you can go back as far as you like or as recent as you like, and I'd like you to retweet any one of my tweets. You pick one that you think was interesting. Maybe I was sharing a video that you'd like to retweet. Maybe there was some something funny that you uh, you enjoyed. Maybe there was something stupid that I put on there that you think <laughs> you'd enjoy humiliating me by re retweeting it. I don't know. Retweet any one of my tweets from my 10 years on Twitter, anyone you like, and I will just pick one of those retweets to give away a signed copy of the book. Uh, there you go. That's it. Simple as that. That's all I want you to do. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. It's uh, nothing particularly groundbreaking today. I just thought it was a moment that should be noted. 10 years on Twitter, 400 videos on YouTube. Massive thank you to all of you guys for getting me this far, because that's what's happened. You lot have got me this far. Uh, long may it continue. I'm enjoying it. So as long as you are as well, I plan to continue. I'll see you soon, folks. Ta-la.